Uh, yeah, I have. Before I move on, I actually have a little bit more to add to the Peter section here. Uh, so I think we, uh, when we were talking, we were talking a little bit about repeaters. The whole thing about repeaters is that you need to find connections if you want to put it on a site, uh, on a repeater site. Uh, most of the cam towers would be willing to put up a repeater. Uh, you should need to find the right people to talk to. Uh, I think people have gotten success with cell towers uh, in other areas, but they might even make you pay for it. Uh, uh, but since ham radio is all for the thrill of it, uh, you might find people willing to put something up like this. Uh, also, you can put something up at a house, because this is actually a uh, family friend I know, and he lives up in the hills, so he has really good line of sight. So if you know someone, or like a neighbor, who has a really good line of sight, you can just put something up for free and not be a nuisance. They'll be fine with it, probably. Uh, all right, I'm going to give it to John. <coughs> all right, what to say, make a pair. Um, for those that don't know, although you saw the pictures earlier in Ben's presentation, uh, we were at open source, Ben put that together, he was leading the charge to show off uh, MeshTastic at open source. Uh, so I took the reins from him and I signed us up for a booth at Bay Area Maker Fair, which is in Vallejo in a couple of weeks, end of October. So if you're in the area and have time, I recommend you stop by because Maker Fair is fun in general. Um, it's a little bit smaller than the days of old. So if you remember a Maker Fair from, you know, 2012 at the San Mateo Convention Center with 150,000 people, it's not quite that. Same concept, but now it's more like 10,000 people. Um, and in Vallejo, for reasons. Uh, but yeah, we're going to have a booth. What you see there is a lot of what the booth is going to be about. What we're talking about is what, a lot of what the booth is about. It's about bringing Meshtastic to those who either have heard of it, haven't heard of it, kind of, sort of, like, or have questions. We're there to answer questions. We're there to uh, bring more information. So like I was saying to the people looking at the infographic sheets, um, if you have any suggestions for information you'd love to see about nodes, please let me know, because these are kind of my, my alpha tests. You're all my alpha testers for what data that's going to be there. Um, the goal is to have a sheet for every different type of node that I have with me, um, which may take up the entire table. Um, but in general, uh, that's most of what uh, Maker Faire is going to be about in terms of uh, MeshTastic. Uh, I know Rockland is going to be there, and uh, Seed Studios is going to be there as well. So Lily, what? Lily. Uh, Lily Go, yeah, Lily Go um, is there with Rockland, mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, who is it? Someone else, I think, might also be there. We were talking to. Um, but all these people are all part of the MeshTastic community. We're going to try to work with them and see what else we can do um, in terms of building a bigger mesh, inviting them to cooperate, and you know, all, all of us play together nicely, <clears throat> even when it's just different manufacturers, but everyone's working towards the same ends of this you know, distributed interconnected mesh. Um, I think some of these groups are also going to be doing talks. I think uh, Seed has invited you to join them for a talk or two. No? OK. <laughs> <laughs> they offered to uh, share a booth, and I say no to sharing booths. Yes. We, we got a booth, thank God. Uh, thank you, by the way. You're welcome. Um, Maker Fair didn't want to approve our booth because they were worried that we were going to interfere with their Wi-Fi. <laughs> It was um, it was fun. Okay. I'm sure it's one of those situations where it's at some outside vendor. You know, inevitably at these event spaces, it's some outside vendor who specializes in Wi-Fi for events, and they probably said everyone that has uh, radio things bad, radio bad. Um, so fortunately, with the help of um, our our Lord and Savior here, we have <laughs> uh, we have we have a booth now. Um, that being said, if anyone wants to help out. Come find me after, and I would love to talk to you. 
uh, because I think we have one or two people for one or two days. Um, it's a three-day event. It's Friday is the um, kind of preview for educational, um, I think, for field trips for schools and a press preview. But it's going to be all Saturday and Sunday. So if you want to come talk about Meshtastic, if you like interacting with people, which I know some of us do not, um, but if you enjoy that and want to talk about it, please come see me because I'd love to have a volunteer or two. Uh, and I think that's about everything to say about, Mesh, uh, about Maker Fair. And uh, there we go. That's, I think you know what this means. Oh, I yeah, I have a little bit to add about Maker Fair. It's uh, at the same time as Pacificon, sadly, oh, yes. all three days, same as Pacificon. <laughs> Uh, I think they're in the same area, so you could probably go to Pacific Con's in San Ramon. Uh, is that close? Uh, yes. Ish. 20 minutes. Oh yeah, okay, it's close. Unplug and replug here. Oh, um, uh, you were serious when you said you were going to put it up. I mean, I, I made this for you totally as a joke. You can do it on that, right? Let's see. Don't slip off. Okay, first off, I want to say thank you to Ben, John. Like, without this, none of this, like, you know, all of us would be here. So please, round of applause, round of applause. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Ben asked me uh, a couple weeks ago, hey, Jim, can you do a talk? I'm like, do a talk about what? I'm like, mm, talk about what got you into Meshtastic and where Meshtastic is going. So that's what you're going to get. You're going to get where, you know, how did I get here? Um, and where are we going? Well, uh, you're in the Bay Area. You must have heard about this thing called Burning Man. Burning Man? Yes? Yes? Anyone? Okay, almost all of us. Well, I've been going to that thing in the desert since 2003. It's been, you know, not an every year thing, it's not even every third year thing, but I do go quite often and I bring a lot to that event. And I went again in 2019. That was the year that, uh, well, the COVID year. Um, people got COVID out there, luckily I didn't. Um, but I hadn't gone again. After that, uh, I took a little time off because the event got shut down. But Burning Man's always in the back of my head. Like, what can I bring to this group? And I, I've got art cars, large scale installations out there. But one of the logistical issues we've had was how do we communicate out there? And I was just looking around for ideas. And I, I saw this video by this guy with a Swiss accent um, about Meshtastic. I'm like, ah, this looks really, really cool. So I, I got onto the uh, the Discord server, uh, so I started talking to some people there, and you know, uh, I've got a background in software engineering, quite good at it at some point in my uh, career. Haven't actually written code for pay in a very, very long time, and uh, here was a reason for me to actually write. I love writing code, but it's got to be for fun. The moment I start writing code for money, PTSD starts to happen. Like, what am I doing, making money for someone else? doing the creative stuff I actually really enjoy doing. So Meshtastic ended up becoming this, this, this output to, uh, to start you know, contributing to something that I actually was passionate about. And you know, it wasn't Meshtastic, it was bringing communication to Burning Man. So if you ever look at all my contributions to the project, literally each and every one of them is there to bring Meshtastic to that thing in the desert at scale. When Meshtastic started, uh, you know, it was, you know, 15, 30 devices at most. And what was that number I saw there? 500 something, right? So it, it, it's grown quite a bit on a single number. Well, uh, I started working on, on Mishtastic and what really gave me the opportunity to do it was COVID. <laughs> a lot of people were laid off. I was in that group. And so I started working on Meshtastic, working on Meshtastic. Um, and uh, I, I gotta say, it just sort of grabbed me and pulled me in. First, I started working on a uh, updated screen so people can see more about their network. 
uh, started working on modules, the, the, the serial module, I think. Uh, Nick, what's your name? Just talking to you. Uh, the, the serial module, right, was one of the first things I worked in there. And one thing led to another. I started working on more and more of the algorithms, the location, uh, the airtime usage. Uh, the 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 uh, signal to noise ratio based uh, algorithm for the actual core routing right just i started contributing a lot of these uh, to the project and you know as i was doing it uh, the founder uh, of meshtastic kevin at one point he just started referring to me as the project lead i'm like what 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 me why me i'm just this guy working on the project and uh, he started introducing me to uh, outside companies as the project lead. I'm like, all right, all right, I, I, I can take this hat. I can, I can take the baton. Sure, I, I see you're going there. You know, Kevin's one of these people who um, is a 10x engineer, right? He, he's just been engineering for all his life and is really, really, really good at it. But for his own reasons, he is mostly fully retired. Um, I, we, we talk now and then, um, and whenever I do. He's always in another country, uh, Spain, Taiwan recently. And he's actually back in town right now for a week. Um, I don't know where he's going after this week, but he is actually back in town. So if you could wait towards San Mateo, he's, he's over there right now. Um, and so as uh, Kevin started to introduce me as the, the project lead, I really started putting on the, the other hat there of uh, kind of a, a, a community creator. Um, a lot of my background uh, was working for a company called communities.com, fostering online communities. Um, I've uh, got far too many certifications on coaching, executive coaching, team coaching, systems coaching, um, and you know, really using all that to make sure that we have a group of people that work nicely together, that can handle conflict resolution. You know, the, the, the things that uh, uh, who, who was it? Was that you, John, who called me Meshtastic Dad? I don't remember if that was you or not. <laughs> yeah, so you come in, you see people uh, not exactly having too much fun with each other, say a couple words, and all of a sudden, okay, okay, they're quiet now. The kids are, are at rest. This is great. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I mentioned... Uh, I used to be a software engineer, right? But uh, if you are one, you know 90% of the software engineering, you know of, of writing the code, it disappears if you don't touch it every year, right? If you don't touch that language, 90% of what's in your head is gonna be gone. You'll get it back. It's just like riding a bike, but it takes a while. And for me, I was not coding for years. And so uh, I ended up taking an online Udemy class uh, C++ for dummies. <laughs> it was 18 hours. How do printfs work again? So if uh, you're thinking about coding, Meshtastic is a great way to learn, great way to start contributing. It's all developed on the Arduino framework, which makes it very, very accessible to people from all levels, right? So uh, if you're all considering it, um, you have a great group of people. I think last time I looked at it, and last time was three weeks ago, uh, 483 contributors to the project um, across our different repositories, right? That's a lot. Um, let's see here. Community. Uh, one of the things I... Is the screen you suddenly turned off, or did <laughs> I just notice it off? Um, talking about community, right? Oh, it's just for your benefit there, because it's, you know, my little hamster picture. <laughs> but yeah, so... You survive without the hamster. I can survive with a hamster. So the community, right, uh, we have the Bay Area group. There are groups all over. Uh, I was actually reached out to by a group in France who's just now starting up, right? There, there are groups all over. And, you know, we are all part of this Mishtastic ecosystem. Um, you know, we, we do have some donations. I want to put it out there. Um, if you as a group are working on something to help Meshtastic grow, I'm not just talking about putting nodes up, right? But if you're doing some research development on Meshtastic, uh, you know, come find us on our Discord um, and we can help, you know, defer some of those costs. So we, we do get some donations um, and you are part of the community. Um, you know, it, these are resources that are available here for you. Uh, let's see here. Uh, where are we going, right? North Star. Um, scale. 
right? That's where we are now. How do we make Meshtastic grow bigger, not only in the software, technology, uh, these public networks, uh, but how do we make it so uh, people who come into the community, first time users, it's easy for them. Uh, we, we have a way to give them support. We have a way to make sure that uh, if you had something to, I, I use my mother as an example, if I had something to my mother, she's not gonna say, what is this? And I don't become technical support for her, right? So, you know, making sure everything is easy to use, can scale, is very important. And uh, scale isn't only about these individual networks. Uh, we're, we have uh, a lot of brainstorming and starting to implement these concepts called community area networks, right? With the community area network, exactly what you're doing here. You're building something for your community. Um, you, it, it's curated, it's something that, uh, uh, you, you defined uh, how you can operate within this framework that you develop, and we want to do more of, more of this. Um, we have a a plan to be able to build a community area network of up to twenty thousand nodes. That, that, that's our you know design goal. How we're going to do this? We've got plenty of good ideas, um, but when we see the, these community area networks like you're doing here. Uh, this is what gives us that NASCAR Formula Formula One experience. Right? We learn from what's going on here. We're monitoring it. We see issues with our routing algorithm, with how often things are being broadcast. We're constantly changing what we're doing by monitoring what you're doing here. So as you grow, right, you, you might think you're just having fun. Just what, you, just you having fun is con contributing a lot to the mesh tastic community. So you know, keep at it here. Keep at it. Um, so uh, scale not only means you know scaling the actual software technology, but the hardware platforms were built on. I was actually uh, out in uh, Shenzhen, China, uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, I had a couple of days out there. I was uh, out on medical leave, and so I took off uh, <laughs> while on medical. Uh, probably not the best idea, lifting uh, luggage. Sorry, Dr. Aaron, uh, <laughs> over my head, but uh, it wasn't too bad there. So. Uh, we've got harder manufacturers that want to help Meshtastic grow. Uh, we, we saw Seed, the Seed Tracker there, they're the newest member of our uh, extended manufacturer uh, technology partners. Um, and and th they hit the ground running, right, really, really hard. Uh, we have examples there from Rack. Uh, Rack has been with us now, gosh, I think they're the, the second or third large large manufacturer, and they're just constantly helping us out, uh, you know, contributing code to the project. And of course, I, I, I can't uh, uh, sit, talk about manufacturers without talking about the Lego. Uh, you know, Lily goes this wonderful woman-owned uh, company. I see about four or five out there. So it's a woman-owned company in Shenzhen, right? You know, being as uh, competitive as Shenzhen is, right? That in itself is amazing. She's a great woman. Um, if you look at the, the Lily Go logo, that actually does look like her. <laughs> She's just this wonderful, and uh, Lily Go's just been there with us, uh, contributing probably about a third of our operating budget right now, right? So uh, not only have they been there, but they've had the vision enough to say, okay, Meshtastic is doing something. Oh, and samples, yes, hardware. Uh, all right, let's see here. Uh, there's the logo. Um, if I point this at the camera, will someone out there see? That is actually what Lily looks like. Yes, with the dress and all. <laughs> But uh, I don't know, uh, this is fun. Uh, we've got a fairly large core team of engineers, uh, depending on how you count it, about 16 people who are now working on Meshtastic. Um, I'm not gonna say full time, but with a whole lot more time than just about anybody else, right? Um, and Mishtastic is growing. Um, we have plans on uh, giving Mishtastic uh, more focused, advanced research and development. Uh, we now have uh, contacts into Semtech directly, that is the manufacturer of the, the LoRa radios. And now it, it, it's great for the last five years. When we try to get a hold of them, they're like, who are you? <laughs> uh, and now send them an email, to, like straight responses from their engineers because they realize with what we're working on here with these networks. Have you heard of this thing called the Helium Network? 
Yeah, uh, the metastatic network is about the same size as helium today, right? Just in the public networks. That in itself is huge, right? We're not as big, but it's pretty gosh darn close. And that's making a lot of people notice what we're doing here. So North Star, keep scaling, keep growing. We grow the community, grow the technology, and of course, grow that the community we have here. That's what I got. Thank you. How's that for a dog and pony? Thank <laughs> you. All right. Uh, so I think for the past like couple of months, uh, there's been a lot of talk in this worldwide mesh tastic of should we be switching to other frequencies, other modem presets and stuff like that. Uh, I think, I forgot what that guy's name is, but the YouTuber in England, he- uh, Andy. Yeah, Andy, he switched everyone over to medium fast. Uh, oh yeah, first he made that YouTube video of like, Meshtastic is dead, I'm making my own LoRa protocol. Uh, and then everyone was like, yeah, Meshtastic sucks in the comments. And then uh, he talked with the devs and he realized that he was just using a really congested network. So then he decided to say everyone switched to medium fast. Uh, and then uh, he had a little bit of issues with that not too many people switched over, plus uh, uh, a little bit less range than he was getting on long fast. So I think he switched back. Uh, but a friend of mine did some testing uh, with some modem presets here. Uh, and you can kind of see that medium fast is actually doing, uh, has a, around like 86 to 91% reliability of getting a message through. Uh, I didn't make this graph, I actually don't fully understand what this graph means. Uh, but. Uh, so I was talking to that same friend of mine and she was telling me that now their group is actually using medium slow and about how they're able to support around like 300 nodes on medium slow. Uh, so I think that within our network, we should start testing uh, these different presets because when you switch the <coughs> preset, uh, it also switches the frequency. Like right now we're all on 906 uh, megahertz. Thank you. You guys still hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I hear it's a little bit discreet to hear you. No, everything's fine. So uh, default it's 906 megahertz. And right now that's getting quite congested. Like recently we got a guy named, no, long name FBEC uh, sending sensor data every minute and he's five hops away from me so he's either he's using five hops plus the default is three so uh he's probably using like six or seven hops uh one every minute uh i don't think he's close to me since he's five hops away but every minute i get his data and i should probably uh ignore him so uh but that's kind of illustrating kind of what the issue is is just that anyone who just buys a device, by default, it's in, on this frequency. If they don't know anything, they don't know any better, they just start broadcasting stuff. And it's just, like, I don't think he's trying to uh, do a denial of service attack on us. Uh, there's probably better ways of doing it. He's probably just trying to get his sensor data. Uh, but that's kind of why we should probably be moving towards our own frequency, because I want something more managed where we can get emergency response on mesh plastic <coughs> using uh, the network too and some more you know important stuff than just uh, network checks and tests going through mesh plastic. Uh, maybe we can support actual conversations from uh, San Jose, like someone talking from San Jose to Oakland just normally. Uh, so. Yeah, my idea is just switching to medium slow, testing that out for a bit. Uh, right now, none of my node neighbors uh, are responding to my DMs. 
because I think they're, you know, they left Discord. Uh, but so if anyone is in Santa Clara, uh, I could test. Uh, but I know some people uh, were testing medium fast in, around San Jose area, and I think that went quite well. But uh, I talked to my friend, and she said that uh, with medium fast in bigger cities, there are some issues, and there's an issue with the length, how long you can get something to get me received. And it's a bit confusing with the naming, Jam. I think you guys named it kind of weirdly, but medium slow is faster than long fast. Uh, it's 80% faster than long fast. Uh, cause it makes sense on the spreadsheet. <laughs> so it's like the medium gives it a speed boost. The slow is just, medium slow is slower than medium fast, but it's still faster than long fast. Uh, and medium slow gets more distance than medium fast. So I think that's probably the mode that we should be using. And uh, I don't know the exact channel that medium slow is on, because when you put in a new uh, modem preset, it does some hashing and it determines a frequency. So it's totally random. Uh, I, I could probably calculate that real fast, uh, but I know it's not going to be 906 megahertz and that's a good thing. Uh, it, it can be if we want to. Yeah, and even if it is the same frequency, the lower spreading factors allow them to cooperate with each other without interference. Yeah, that too. Uh, and I just want, yeah, my idea is a more managed mesh. Like I want a spreadsheet of uh, node names, the locations, you know, the owners. So if something's going wrong, you can contact the owners and stuff like that. Because uh, with uh, long fast, it's kind of I've tried putting out announcements about what settings people should be using. Uh, John uh, put it on the website, like we have the recommended settings and stuff like that, but it's not really going too well. Because most of the thing is that when you have a node that's stationary, it should not be sending out its location every 30 minutes. 30 minutes is the default. Like you should set it to like a two days, every two days it sends its location or its node info. Uh, but, and uh, I think there's a really good video by the comms channel about what roles to, because uh, a lot of misusing of the router role, because uh, router does work well on really high sites, but on houses and especially if you have in your car or in your hand a router, it's going to not work too well. Uh, uh, even if your uh, node, you have a handheld node with 8 dBi, it's not going to do much routing if it's just on such a low elevation. Uh, so my recommendation is if it's on a tower, it's router, and if it's, if it's in your pocket, it's client mute. And if it's like anywhere else, like on your house, on your roof, it's client, uh, that kind of stuff. So just so, uh, that's my idea. And I'm going to probably make an announcement. We'll probably uh, do stuff, some te more testing before we start pushing everyone to the new network uh, that we probably build up. Can I add a comment? Yeah. All right, so one other thing that I think goes with this that is worthwhile talking about. Um, the joys of the default setting is that everyone turns on their node and they're instantly part of the mesh. But it also means that they turn on their node and they're part of the default mesh, regardless of what they're doing or how they're setting it up. So um, I'm trying to put this, trying to figure out how to put this tactfully and not make this a political argument. But recently there have been problems. New users have been joining the mesh, and this is globally, um, using things like the, the T1000E, which has built-in GPS and whatnot. And they flip on the options for location, and they're now on the internet, on cool maps like that. And they don't know about this. So bad things have happened. And so uh, the Meshtastic devs have wisely made changes so that it is not as easy to share your default location. Um, so you're not putting a pinpoint on the map saying, I am here, come find me. 
Um, the smallest circle I think it is now is 0.2 miles or 0.6 miles, something to that effect. Um, so some users want to share their exact location. I have my, my vehicle node set up to share my exact location. I have no problem with that. Um, as we go to a potential for our own community mesh, these are the things that we want to think about is how we instruct people on this, because with the default, you can no longer make those sorts of mistakes. But as we go to our own community, if we change the settings, people now have the option to send their precise location again. We want to make sure that people understand what the implications of these changes are when they change their node, because you, most of these changes are just, you know, we put up a QR code and you scan the QR code with your phone and it, it loads it up in your app. But we want to make sure that people aren't making these same mistakes again, where they're sharing the location, they're not aware, it might be online, it might not, or they just don't understand what that means. So we, as we go to this new community mesh, our own custom configurations, we want to make sure that the instructions are the right. So for those of you who are new coming in, ask questions, tell us when the, the documentation isn't sufficient. Especially since I'm, if you go to Bay Mesh website, that, that's all me. So if there's anything wrong, anything sucks, yell. We have a, you know, in Discord, we have a hashtag websites channel that you can yell at me, or you can just yell at me in any channel in Discord and I will respond. Um, I appreciate the feedback so that, you know, I recently was informed, hey, some of this stuff doesn't make sense because the person setting it up was not using an iPhone. And I had all the configuration options written for an iPhone. Um, and these are some of the things that you don't necessarily think about. So as we go into the you know, new potential community mesh, think about these things. You know, what would you worry about? What are your concerns? Ask us. Tell us. Hey, you guys don't have any documentation covering these things. We want to make sure everyone knows so that no one is surprised by these sorts of things. And we don't end up in a situation where people get upset in ways that, you know, potentially involve lawyers and things like that, uh, which no one wants. Which I'm paying for. Which <laughs> <laughs> JM is paying for, and he doesn't want to. And we don't want to either, because unlike the default MQTT, as, as some of you might know, we have our own custom MQTT, and it goes to this guy's server. Um, and I don't want any lawyers either. I want to make sure that everyone He's understands. all your data. I am not stealing all your data. I'm not even saving the data. <laughs> but someone else might be stealing the data that's on there. Ipso facto, Columbo, Oreo. We all get screwed if we don't think about these things. This has been demonstrated. So I just want to make sure that that was talked about as well. I do have a question about onboarding new users to your mesh. I found this mesh because I put myself on default settings and I saw the open host router, which I have yep. linked to your website. How are we going to inform new users if we're switching to a different mesh entirely? Uh, that's actually an idea I was thinking about. Uh, so I was about to say that he made a really good website and we should advertise it. So if you have a node, you, you could probably put it in your long name like I do because uh, uh, like I have it in my long name just to onboard users to the Discord so they can see all the info. Because um, yeah. I was gonna say, I think the answer is the same way you did today. Okay. A lot of us have the capability of putting up multiple devices, so we can have one device that's just broadcasting every so often. Hey, stop by Baymash. Hey, go to our website, read the thing. Like some of the changes, like switching to. Uh, medium, slow, or one of the different speeds is incompatible with the default mesh. If we stay with long, fast, and just change our default channel to be something different, then we can still interoperate by using the default configuration as a secondary channel. But I think at the end of the day, it's just having a few nodes that are still up in high places, like the Diablos, that are broadcasting a long name of basically stop by the website, stop by our Discord, talk to us, we'll help you. And also, realistically, it's like Meshtastic is not supposed to be one mesh for everyone. Mm -hmm. The community air mesh, mesh stuff is still coming, but today it was not designed for 500 people across a thousand square miles, right? 30. <laughs> yeah. 30 people. Yeah. You had a question? Oh, yeah. I was wondering what was your uh, Discord handle? 
I'm Shikata Ganai. Oh, uh, that makes sense. Nice meeting you. And your RCGV yeah. underscore. Yeah, and then Kino60 at TM and my. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah, about the location sharing. <laughs> uh, for me, I kind of put everything out there. So I have my nodes uh, broadcasting my house location, and I have my call sign in my Discord name, call sign in, in the uh, long name, so everyone can search me up. Uh, but a lot of the people that are joining the mesh are security focused uh, people who I mean, are not hams or are not interested in sharing your info. That's the thing. I'm I'm a ham and I'm a security guy, but I understand that as a ham radio operator, my information's out there. I think everyone who's a ham radio operator here knows that your home address is published on the FCC database and lots of other databases, but not everyone's kosher with that. And as devices get easier, like the T1000E, which is, you know, just attached to your backpack type thing, anyone can buy it. You don't need to understand 3D printing or wiring up batteries or whatnot. It's going to be easier for people to join the mesh and therefore more likely user error is going to be introduced. Or even if not user error, um, mistakes will be made that people don't understand the implication of. Yeah, like uh, if you want to create your own mesh, uh, like I would recommend if you want to do something really specific, like you want to do monitoring of your farm or something like that, and there's cover we have coverage over your farm, I'd recommend uh, don't use the default. Yeah. Just go on a different frequency, go on encryption, like uh, the traffic, your traffic will probably go on our mesh and I'll pollute it a little bit. Uh, like it's, but we I can. <laughs> yes. Can I just make my own channel? Yes, you can. And you can change the encryption on that. And as long as your default channel is still the default, I believe, the default ones will yeah, uh, pick that up. So there's a primary channel and secondaries. So primaries is the one that dictates what your frequency is. So this is the main mistake I made when getting started is, so I took my primary channel, I just renamed it to public because I that was the public channel. And when you rename the channel, it changes the frequency, which is so weird. Uh, I still think that should be changed because uh, lots of people change their channel name. Like it's like a group chat, you should change the group chat name to something that's understandable for you. But the hashing works is where uh, if you rename it to like uh, uh, home and then you have long fast enabled, then anyone else that has their channel named home and long fast, you're on the same frequency as the same, uh, you know, modem preset. So the default, the way the default works is if your channel has no name, the default hashing will make it go to 906.875 megahertz. Uh, and that's where it's all situated. Uh, but you could stay basically what, what you could do is you can have it on the same frequency, but your primary is encrypted. So you can have encrypted traffic that like, we don't understand that traffic, but the nodes are still forwarding it. Uh, so you can do that. Like basically you're an unknown, but your packets are still being forwarded. Uh, or you can use a secondary channel and that secondary is encrypted and you could just have encrypted group chat, but uh, everyone's still forwarding it. Uh, but for more, you know, custom stuff like let's say you're monitoring a farm, you need a lot of traffic going through and you want it fully custom, just go to a different frequency, use encryption and whatnot. Create your own mesh. Yes. That's what's for. All right, you go camping, don't use the default. Use your own. Actually, I would recommend using the default for camping because uh, if you find someone out there, that would be cool. Or you can just use whatever's infrastructure someone built out already. I, okay. We may have different opinions. The important thing to remember is on default, anyone can see your traffic and you can see anyone else's. So just remember that when you've got location, you're out camping, some people may want to find random hangers and some people may not want to share that they're out there camping. All right, uh, yeah, this. Speaking of. Uh, so uh, I kind of put this slide here because it's something that kind of interests me. Uh, so emergency preparedness and emergency response using Meshtastic. So I kind of want to, uh, see if we can do a system using Meshtastic, try to integrate it. Uh, for those that don't know, Aries, there's these organizations called Aries and Races, 
uh, I forgot what they stand for. I think something with amateurs and something with uh, emergencies. Uh, <laughs> Almost all the letters. <laughs> Amateur radio emergency. What? Service. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of a joke, but uh, so I want to see if we can get this system integrated with their organization somehow, because uh, I do have contact with some people in that. Uh, and moving frequencies, moving modem presets would allow us to accommodate them, because uh, they just need to send text messages and location data. Because the use case I'm thinking is that. Uh, they could uh, do GPS tracking mostly because uh, right now I think most people use APRS in ham radio, but uh, it's a bit hard to set up. It's more outdated and uh, it's not doing mesh. Uh, but with Meshtastic, you can do ATAC integrations. So you can have these cool tactical stuff going. Uh, I don't know why the. Oh, there. There we go. Uh, so I, kn uh, I know the Cupertino Amateur Radio, uh, no, uh, I forgot what their acronym is, but they're, I think they're C -A -R -E -S. CARES, yeah, uh, I think they're ARIES, yes. yeah, the Cupertino ARIES organization. So uh, I know the guy who runs that and what they did is they put a node on top of their mass on their comms van that they used for uh, for their deployments. And I think it went quite well for him, uh, able to reach a lot of nodes. And the idea would be that they're gonna, they would probably operate on our mesh uh, if we have good coverage and that the channel utilization is lower. Because right now it's kind of impossible, like, uh, let's say an emergency, there's, everyone starts texting, uh, our mesh is already kind of, uh, overutilized and everyone's sending, uh, you know, trying to get out there, uh, stuff is going to break and it's not going to go well. Uh, so with these motor presets that support our messages, uh, even though there's not that many people, you have to account for if everyone's trying to get out there, everyone's trying to send a message and this would allow that to happen. Uh, and if we put this on multiple repeater sites, then this could uh, help these organizations that they could just get on our mesh and use what we already have and maybe even create their own encrypted or just different group channels that they can use. Uh, yeah, that's kind of the end of that. Does anyone have anything to add? All right. Moving on to the final section. Uh, this is what I call nodes and tell. Uh, if you have a node or just, if you want to talk about anything related to Meshtastic, come up here uh, five to 10 minutes or less. You can just talk about something. Uh, yeah. I think John wants to come. Yeah. I, I mean, my notes are out, out there. I think I think everyone's seen the nodes. I was just coming up to. No, no volunteers. I guess we're gonna have to force people up here. Mm. Uh, so, uh, has anybody tried uh, CAN messages? And is that something that anybody's tried? I don't know. I had some success with it, but what, what what do you mean? What by can? You mean the good morning that I said Yeah. <laughs> no, oh, no, can. I mean, like a little rotate, you know, like oh, a, can. Oh, the actual can messages. Yeah, yeah. That's, I think we've seen some people use it. I think some people have wired up buttons and uh, uh, to to fire off different can messages. Okay. Is anybody here got it? Didn't know that was a thing. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, one of the modules is can can message module. So if you, there's something that you commonly send, like for those of us driving around, like want to check in a specific location, you can quickly, you know, uh, pop out a, a specific location for a note to someone. Yes. 
Who knows about store and forward? Yes, store and forward. Uh, ESP32 only. I wrote it. <laughs> Do you use it? What's that? Do you use it? Well, what was the use case you had in mind when you wrote it? Uh, I did start off. I wrote Burning Man. The use case was to use it at Burning Man. Right? Uh, you might be behind a uh, large art sculpture, you're not, you're not getting a message, your battery didn't last that long, you come back to camp, you mess, I miss the message, say, come get us, right? Uh, those are the use cases. Um, I've heard of people using it uh, at music festivals, it's a really popular one. Um, it, it seems to be a, a very niche use case. Compare with uh, somebody put up a BDS on the <laughs> I did see that. I saw someone put up a, a Zork uh, online one. Yes. It's just a intelligent way of storing the messages that have been received and being able to ask for it whenever you like. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, go for it. Has anybody done uh, nodes or relays or anything on near water, or near the ocean? Yeah, I know a guy who knows something about that. <laughs> uh, there's a company out in Washington State uh, that has uh, mesh plastic deployed on buoys floating out in the Puget Sound. Big old yellow ones, right? Uh, I do not remember the. What they actually look like. This yeah. was three years ago when they deployed this. Nice yeah. yeah. They're, they're water buoys, yes. Yeah. Totally. Uh, fairly large with a solar. solar and lead acid battery at the bottom. Yeah. Is, uh, yes. Yeah, because you need a way. Yep, yep. They're, they're using it for open ocean pollution monitoring. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we've seen a few people ask about like sailboat developments. Because the thing about it is like water is mostly flat so as long as you can get the higher you get basically you're talking about at that point in time the range is more or less limited by the curvature of the earth because there's not much in the way of um interference either hf mesh testing hf mesh testing oh the blue map oh yeah oh uh, yeah a little bit about the bbs uh sadly no one's actually I don't think many people are using store forward anymore after uh, Comms Channel introduced the BBS. Uh, I would, I, I was planning to, if I get time, maybe rewriting it in a language other than Python, because I despise that, that language. It's uh, the only right language to use. No. <laughs> <laughs> Stay away from the dark side. Yeah, yes. Uh, I'm trying to do that. But uh, I'm just showing some packets uh, received by from the SF Hab balloon launch that I was talking about earlier. Uh, so this was the first packet. Uh, it was, oh, I actually don't remember. Is this feet? Is this meters? Uh, 528 something altitude. Can you context? What, what, are we, what are we seeing a map of? Uh, so this is packets that were received by gateways of a mesh plastic balloon payload. I think I showed the actual, what the balloon payload actually looked like. Uh, but it was... This is the bay just north of San Pablo. I see. Those are the reported positions of the balloon. Correct. Yeah. I think it's meters. Oh, yeah. Okay, meters. 528 meters. It was really cool. So we launched it from Point Pinot. Uh, you can see here, it looks like. Uh, so we launched it, and then I was just checking my phone from my note, and I could just see it going up, 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 and getting more packets. I sent, uh, I set it to report it actually quite often. So what it did is it like curved this way. Uh, let me see if I, oh, there we go. There's the 3D. So here's what it looks like in full 3D. Uh, so it just rose up here, uh, and what's happening is that we have gateways which are connected to the internet, sending to the server somewhere out here. I think we had a map of all the gateways received, but I think it got taken down. I could probably find a screenshot somewhere. Uh, but we have the gateway council one, gateway received it, 
the one here, 2,000 meters. Uh, so there's, and then there's four that received it here. So four gateways, I think. It was like the North and East Bay receiving it. Uh, and six, yeah, it was. And then for some reason, it just, it was like this, the sweet spot was like right here when it got received by six gateways. I'm thinking it's something with antenna design, the polarization, like it's so high up that it's harder to hit stuff. Uh, and then this was, uh, this? uh yeah, 12,000 meters. Uh, that was the last position that was reported. This was hit all the way in Sacramento, so. Right. Oh, here, so I don't remember exactly where in Sacramento. Uh, some, yeah, it's just so far. Uh, that was the craziest thing. So we can do a lot more experimentation with Meshtastic. Uh, right now, it's kind of, the messages aren't going through so well, but uh, with Meshtastic right now, our long, fast network is good for us, APRS kind of stuff. Uh, so we have those maps available and you can track yourself driving, uh, if you want to kind of use it like APRS, just don't set your stuff to send every two seconds. So that won't be very good. Uh, but yeah, I said earlier, noise bridge, uh, we're going to be doing a launch too. And I want to see how that goes because, uh, that might actually uh, be better because I gave them some, some my advice with the antennas. Uh, but that was kind of a cool thing I want to share. That, that just solves the repeater problem, right? We just, we don't need mountains. We'll just send up a balloon every day. Every day. And you can just, <coughs> what you do is you have a balloon and then you just tie it to a rope and then just keep it up there. Just uh, like the police do. <laughs> or you just put a drone. I think someone in the Discord was like overcomplicating this. He's like, what if we put a drone? We have a cable running down with, with uh, that charges it, and it stays up there for forever. And I think the balloon is the easier option out of that. Uh, but yeah, these are cool because uh, repeating. This was actually not a repeater. This was just sending packets down. It was, uh, and we would just scrape everything that contained the node info, all the packets that we received from that node. We would scrape that up and put it on the map. So that's the really cool thing we can do with network integration. So uh, how high did the balloon end up going? 100,000 feet change. Oh, wow. Uh, it ended up, what it ended up doing is uh, going all the way up, then bursting, and then uh, ending up somewhere here in the bay. Uh, so it went for a swim. Uh, the hardware all probably died, uh, but the balloon actually floated. Uh, some random guy picked it up, uh, called the phone number, uh, and was it actually, did he return it? I didn't, I didn't hear that. Yeah, uh, I think uh, the guy was like really weird. Like he said, I got it, but then he ghosted us when, he was like, when can we pick it up? So some guy has the balloon pieces and the $20 investment I made into a note for it. It's probably all uh, dead, but I was just interested in seeing the actual harbor, but probably won't be recovered. Uh, but it's good that there's not uh, batteries in the ocean now. feel a little better about that because it was like, oh, we just sent some batteries in the, into the bay, uh, but at least it floated. Question? Yeah, sure. Has anyone had any experience with directional antennas? I work for a whisper, right? so we have a lot of point to point networks and then it branches out. But it'd be cool like, to get a few directional antennas like on top of the mountains, just to route the tracking really far away and then spread it out. We talked about this a lot. Yeah. <clears throat> so. So we, we talked about this in concept because there is, with a directional antenna, we could use something like uh, short pass. And because the short being short range is not really applicable once you're talking about yagis that are, you know, 14 dB or more. Um, 
the problem is right now you need two radios in the middle, basically one to receive one direction, one to receive the other, and then you're adding a hop or more in that relay. Um, but I think that's something that's in your community area network plan is the concept of like backhauls a little bit, mm -hmm. did I see? Yes, yes. So I don't think anyone's done too much with it in terms of like, we're just gonna set up Yogi's today. I've talked about it just as, you know, as a concept for me at home to be like, oh, let me see if I can shoot specifically at a mountain to get it. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll let him talk about the can. So, so not the can, but so uh, I'm in San Francisco and uh, I'm almost at the top of a mountain, like right, on one of the hills, which means there's no reason for me to send signal behind me. And so I have a uh, a Moxon antenna pointed into the bay. And uh, one of our early um, uh, range records is actually in uh, New Zealand, point to point, uh, you know, 200 something kilometers or 100 something kilometers using just these Moxon antennas. So it, it doesn't take much to get better than what these little rubber duckies will give you. And if, you know, at least in my use case in San Francisco, uh, having an antenna actually send the energy where it's not going to be absorbed by the mountain. Useful, right? Is it there a legal issue with that? Or directional antennas on part 50? Um, as long as the total energy is below that one watt, you're okay. Now the other part of part 15 is uh, you're not supposed to have SMA antenna connectors. So yeah. there's that too. <laughs> I mean, yeah, this is kind of a twitchy place to play. Rich so. Jessica is a software project, not a hardware project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was very diplomatic. Although, again, you're a ham license, you can. Uh, I mean, I've got a ham license. Yeah, so you can transmit off to a half kilowatt. But I mean, like, you know, um, one of the projects that I've been tangentially involved with is Arnold, which is a sort of more conventional Wi Fi based meshing solution that's deployed in the way as well. And that does have one point of use in high gain antennas. Mm -hmm. It's like um, obviously a lot of higher through the as well. So, so, yeah. Hey, you're actually putting me on the map once. Thank you. What's your, node, what's your main node name? Uh, WCRT. I know your location now. Yes, you know exactly where my house is. And you can see exactly where I set it up. Which is on the wrong side of the house, but that doesn't matter. Why are we at the map up? And just showing a little bit more about uh, what network integration gives us, uh, just this whole view of what's going on in the network. Uh, yeah, it's like, look, this is my Foothills router. Uh, oh, it just got updated three minutes ago. So. I can see where my battery's at. So, uh, battery is at 91%. So this guy is, I set it up at like 99% uh, three weeks ago. It's 91 right now. Uh, so it's charging back up. Uh, so it's quite nice just to get that. Any other questions? Comments, concerns, anything anyone wants to say? So my home location, I live sort of at the bottom of a hole, basically. And, and so the, I don't know what, I mean, the, the way that I would deal with this in, in the ARM network is basically to tunnel out via conventional internet. And obviously that's not desirable from a strictly RF standpoint, but it does enable connectivity in ways that, ways that aren't otherwise accessible to you. Um, what what do you what's the general feeling about that kind of thing within the uh, within the mesh network universe? Uh, so in this network, uh, uh, personally, I don't want to see uh, network connectivity over the internet because that's not really what we're trying to do. Because uh, oh, I can text someone over the internet. Oh, that's not really cool. Uh, there's a thousand million ways of how you can do that. And if we're trying to build something that can survive uh, a natural disaster, uh, that won't work. Actually, maybe Starlink, but uh, but that would be cool if you can get it sending over Arden Wi-Fi. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've 
biggest big problem with my hard network, right? I, I am like I don't currently have access to a site that's high enough to ping the other clients in the network. And that's a tricky thing. So so when I first got started, Walnut Creek was the same. I was the only user out in Walnut Creek. There was no one to talk to, there was no relays. Uh, I turned on MQTT down. Um, we now strongly discourage that to everyone. And if you're on the main uh, Meshtastic MQTT server, you can't. They, I mean, they have changed it so that there's effectively zero hops remaining, so your messages won't go out. Um, with our MQTT server, you can do that. Um, I would say that it's still strongly discouraged if you're going to do it. Um, turn your broadcast power down so that your messages aren't going to end up on random happen chance bouncing out on a lucky night and getting back into the network, even though they shouldn't. You know, the network is theoretically smart enough, but, you know, there's, there's only so much you can do short of, you know, finding a hilltop to, to rely off of, unfortunately, for, for RF. I mean, I have thought of constructing a sort of Pirate solar powered node, hiding it on somebody's property somewhere. <laughs> I I would never suggest anyone take any sort of legal action. That being said, we have seen people putting nodes in places that they may or may not have approval to do so. Um, this could again, be construed as a for an emergency. I built this battery powered box, which I need to test again. Right again. <laughs> We strongly recommend against doing anything illegal. We recommend that you contact the property owners if you're going to put devices on their property. Um, some people are actually pretty cool about this kind of stuff. Um, we also greatly ask that you don't attach nodes at random to infrastructure. Um, when you attach random things to power lines, cops get called, FBI gets called. We start seeing headlines, you know, Meshtastic, is it a terrorist communications network or some crazy shit like that? I mean, no, but unfortunately this is the world we live in. Um, so I would, I would just suggest that if you live in that sort of area, see if you can find someone who's willing to let you stick it. Because, you know, a thing on a pole, a, a solar node with a rack unit can last several days on a very small battery. Uh, so my comment on that is I've actually seen people do that. Like I'm in this SoCal Discord. Uh, what they do is they have a their network. I would say it's a little bit a lot more reliable than us because they have a lot more high uh, nodes on high places. Like first of all, they probably have. I've seen that they have a lot more repeater sites, like uh, contact with repeater owners. But I've seen that what they do is they go to like some. Uh, to the top of a hill, like hike to the top of a hill, it was like a water tank, like take like a magnetic node with camo on it and stick it to the side of the water tank. Uh, yeah, if, they, if someone goes up there for maintenance and finds that, they'll probably freak out. Uh, so that might not be a good idea. Yes, again, uh, please don't do illegal things. Leaving random nodes in places that you don't have approval is... Can this spoils the fun for everybody. Please. Yes, that's, that's the base. It causes somebody to have a bad conversation, even if nothing happens. It's yeah, like, that's that's the reality. Is like it only takes one person. Like I've seen it on Reddit. I've seen the pictures sure. of someone literally attaching and like crawling up a fifty thousand, you know, uh, kill uh, whatever it's kilovolt yeah, tower and attaching <laughs> a node to the side of it. And it's only a matter of time until one of those sorts of things gets found. The FBI will get called because they will take it as something on national infrastructure and then bad things are going to happen for everyone. So who are the Moonanites? What's that? Moonanites. Moonanites? Yeah. It's uh, ad adult, adult Swim did a marketing campaign years ago where they had a bunch of magnetic battery powered devices. Bomb squad showed up oh, yeah. and a uh, multi-million dollar settlement was ultimately reached. Yeah. And, and the Meshtastic project, the, the, the financials are open source. You can go see them on OSC. You can donate. Um, you can also see that there isn't millions of dollars um, in the project to pay for the FBI getting grumpy at these sorts of things. So, you know, please don't attach it to infrastructure. If you're going to leave it somewhere, you know, try to ask someone.
Now, my advice, if you have no one near you, uh, there's a guy in our Discord, he has a saying, uh, plant a node, grow a mesh. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but it's the same philosophy on our network as well. Uh, so just ask around, ask neighbors, ask friends, family, uh, if they're willing to put something up or just get them interested and they might just get involved in it too. Yeah, it's a lot of it's finding the right people. You find their city workers who are interested in this sort of things and can convince their city to let them put up a couple nodes. Um, there are STEM teachers in schools who are interested in using Meshtastic as a STEM teaching tool who might be willing to work with their district to get approval to put up a repeater on the school. Um, so there is a lot of infrastructure out there if you're willing to approach someone. We even have a couple of nodes that are on fire stations, like with legitimate approval. I don't know who, I don't know how. But Yo, we're gonna tell them, we have a few nodes that are on fire stations. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, my bad. <laughs> Anything else for the open session? No? Okay. I am going to say, unless Ben has something else, you have anything else you want to say? I oh, don't know. I'm just trying to find the fire station. No. Yeah, it's like station 35. Yeah. I'm not the only one that sees those messages. Um, yeah. Uh, they're not going to kick us out immediately, but I do want to say thank you for everyone to coming down. I appreciate it. Um, some of us came for quite a distance um, for our first impromptu uh, meetup thing. Um, that clearly we need to get a little bit better at what we're going to talk about and we're learning from these experiences, but we appreciate everyone coming by um, and hopefully enjoying the pizzas. I think it's all gone. Excellent. Um, and so, yeah, with that, I want to say have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we're not technically out.